Music is one of the great pleasures in life. It lifts our spirits and calms the residue of a hectic day. We use it to relax, to celebrate, and to share. Today's customers truly appreciate high quality sound systems, especially in the vehicles they drive. That's why Chrysler Corporation has spent countless hours developing a wide variety of sound systems that provide years of listening enjoyment and pleasure for their customers. Hello, and welcome to this edition of Master Tech 1995 Chrysler Sound Systems. This video release is divided into three sections. In section one, we'll take a look at two new radios that have been added to the Chrysler Sound System lineup for 1995. Plus, we'll talk about the differences between the various speaker systems available on Chrysler Corporation vehicles. And in section two, we'll give you some helpful hints on upgrading the Neon, Chrysler Cirrus, and Dodge Stratus with Mopar sound system accessories. In this segment, you'll learn how to install an entire sound system and a CD changer. Then in section three, we'll look at some common sound system problems you may run into at your dealership. Plus, we'll give you valuable tips on how to diagnose the Infinity Gold sound system on the Jeep Grand Cherokee. As you can see, this release is jam-packed with plenty of information. So, let's get started. There are six corporate radios offered for 1995. Four of them are carryover from the 94 model year, and they are identified by their sales codes. RAY, RBC, RAL, and RAS. The two new radios include RBS and RBG. Each radio and its corresponding sales code is shown in this month's reference book. The new RBS radio is available on the Chrysler Cirrus and Neon. It's an electronically tuned AM-FM stereo radio that has several features you may be familiar with. For example, the RBS radio is equipped with an up and down seek feature, bass and treble slide controls, a joystick speaker control, Dolby B noise reduction, and an integral digital clock. The RBS system also features the cassette tape player that has an automatic tape head cleaner that will clean the cassette head whenever a tape is loaded into or ejected from the system. In addition to the head cleaner, the tape player has an automatic tape pinch roller release that protects the tape and drive mechanism whenever it's not in use. The player also includes auto reverse and a locking fast forward and rewind control. The RBS radio is equipped with controls for the radio, tape player, and CD changer. A new Mopar 6 disc CD changer can be hooked up to the RBS radio through the CD port located at the rear of the radio. And it works with the radio's internal logic through the radio push buttons. The RBS radio, however, will not work with other aftermarket CD changers. It only works with the new 1995 Mopar 6 disc changer. An amplifier located under the front passenger seat is also included with the RBS radio. It can produce a total of 100 watts of power. The new RBS radio is designed with six push buttons to store 24 radio stations in its push button memory. This means you can program two AM and two FM stations on each push button. The same six push buttons are also used to directly access the six compact discs when the radio is in the CD mode. To commit a radio push button to memory, select a radio station. Then press and release the set button. A set one message will appear in the radio's display window. Then press and release the push button you want to commit to memory within five seconds. This will set the radio's memory to that push button. To add a second station to the same push button, select another station. Then press the set button twice. Now a set two message appears. When you see the set two display, press the selected push button within five seconds. This will commit the second station to memory. That's all there is to it. Just remember to use the same procedure whenever you're committing either AM or FM stations to memory. As mentioned earlier, the RBS radio has a mode button. 
It allows you to select the radio band or CD changer. For example, if you wish to change from FM to AM, just push the mode button. The radio switches the band and displays the radio mode next to the station frequency. And whenever the selection falls on an FM stereo station, an ST symbol will appear in the display window, showing that a stereo station is being received. The Seek button will help you search for the next station on a particular frequency band. To move up the band, press the top of the button. To move down, press the bottom. If you continually hold down the button, the radio will bypass all the stations on the frequency until it's released. The joystick fader control is another feature that will get lots of use on the RBS radio. It allows you to balance the sound between the front and rear speakers, as well as the left and right speakers. This control is very useful when diagnosing sound system problems, but we'll talk more about that a little later in the program. Now let's take a look at another new entry in the Chrysler Sound System lineup. The RBG radio is used on the 1995 Neon, Chrysler Cirrus, and Dodge Stratus. The new electronically tuned AM-FM stereo radio features an up and down seek button, plus a digital clock. But the big feature on the RBG radio is the integral compact disc player. And like all Chrysler CD players, it's very simple to operate. But there are a few operating features we ought to go over, just in case a customer asks. First of all, you don't need to turn the radio on to insert or eject a compact disc. Only the ignition needs to be turned on. To insert a disc with the ignition on and the radio off, slide the CD in the player port. The player will automatically draw it inside. To remove the disc, press the eject button. To play the disc, turn the radio on. The system automatically switches to the CD mode. And it shows the first CD track in the radio display. The CD player's stop play button controls the system. If you press the button, the CD unit will stop and the radio will begin to play. If you press the stop play button again, the CD will resume play from the same point as when it was stopped. The compression button provides a consistent sound level while listening to a CD in a noisy environment. It's used when low sound passages become inaudible. For example, if you can hear loud sounds like cymbals or bells coming from a musical piece, but you can't hear the soft violins, press the comp button. The compression circuitry in the system will provide a consistent sound level so that you can hear all of the musical instruments. The radio displays a CP symbol when compression is activated. When Chrysler engineers develop a sound system for a vehicle, the radio is matched with a speaker system that's custom designed for that vehicle. For example, the Infinity Spatial Imaging Sound System was developed especially for the LH vehicles and it's one of the most sophisticated sound systems available today. The goal of spatial imaging is to produce a sound as if it were coming from a soundstage. In other words, it puts the instruments and vocals in their proper locations on a stage, producing a sound similar to a home theater system. To achieve this effect, Chrysler engineers place 11 speakers in seven strategic locations throughout a vehicle. The speakers work together with the radio, tape cassette or CD player, and the 120-watt trunk-mounted amplifier to produce spatial imaging. The key to the spatial imaging sound system is the Infinity speakers. Their position in a vehicle is crucial in providing the best sound quality possible. At each end of the instrument panel, there's a coaxial speaker which provides most of the sound reproduction and imaging characteristics for the front seat passengers. The coaxial speaker is really two speakers in one. It integrates a mid-range speaker and a one-inch dome tweeter in the same unit. Normally, tweeters feature a conventional speaker cone, but the Infinity system takes advantage of a dome design that disperses sound over a wide area. The coaxial speaker ensures clear sound reproduction in both the high and mid-range frequencies. 
But by far the most important speaker in the spatial imaging system is the center channel speaker. It provides the system with the center channel imaging, just like a sophisticated home theater sound system. The center channel speaker produces all the mid-range frequencies, and it fills in the sound gaps that are normally produced by traditional vehicle audio systems. By filling all the sound gaps, the listener can actually hear where vocalists and musicians are located on the sound stage. The speakers that produce low frequencies, or bass, are called woofers. They're mounted at the lower front end of the door. The low and mid-frequency woofers work with the system's power amplifier to project a strong sound. The polypropylene speaker cone provides the woofer with consistent sound throughout the low and mid-range frequencies. In the rear package shelf, there is another set of coaxial speakers featuring a woofer and mid-range speaker. They produce most of the bass and mid-range frequencies for the Infinity Spatial Imaging Sound System. Another system that we should talk about is the Infinity Gold Sound System. This system is only available on the Jeep Grand Cherokee. And like the spatial imaging system, it's designed to deliver clear resonant sound. As a custom designed sound system, the Infinity Gold System features a four channel 120 watt amplifier, an AM stereo FM stereo radio, a tape cassette or compact disc player, plus eight Infinity speakers in six locations. And as I mentioned previously, the key to the system is where the speakers are placed. The Grand Cherokee features a high efficiency woofer at the low forward end of each front door. A tweeter, positioned at each end of the instrument panel, elevates the sound stage and provides the system with its outstanding clarity. At the low forward end of each rear door, there's a coaxial speaker. The third sound system that we need to talk about is the premium sound system, available on the all-new Chrysler Cirrus and Dodge Stratus. When Chrysler engineers were given the responsibility to develop a premium sound system for these vehicles, their primary objective was to design a system that would deliver the highest quality at a low price. They achieved their goal by placing eight speakers in six different locations throughout the vehicle. The speakers work in conjunction with a radio, a tape cassette or CD player, and a 60-watt amplifier, which is mounted under the front passenger seat. Chrysler sound engineers mounted the power amplifier beneath the front passenger seat because that location provides two advantages. First, it increases the efficiency of the sound system because shorter wire lengths are needed to connect the system's components. And second, the interior of a vehicle provides a stable temperature and humidity for the amplifier. The premium sound system on the Chrysler Cirrus and Dodge Stratus produces 100 watts of power. Two tweeters are mounted far apart at each end of the instrument panel. The woofers, which produce the low frequencies, are mounted high at the forward end of each front door. In the rear package shelf, there are two coaxial speakers. As I've mentioned previously, Chrysler sound systems are specially designed to provide our customers with the best sound reproduction possible. That's why it's so important for us to keep you up to date with the latest service information, because we want our customers to be thoroughly satisfied with the sound system they've purchased. Now that we've discussed many of the important features found on Chrysler sound systems, let's try a review question to check your knowledge. Which Chrysler sound system features a 120-watt trunk-mounted amplifier? A, the Infinity Spatial Imaging Sound System, B, the Infinity Gold System, or C, the premium sound system on the Chrysler Cirrus and Dodge Stratus? The answer is A, the Chrysler Infinity Spatial Imaging Sound System features the 120-watt trunk-mounted amplifier as a major component in its system. Selling accessories to upgrade inventory vehicles has turned into a tremendous opportunity for everyone at our dealerships. And that's because a lot of value-conscious buyers want to purchase an economical vehicle, but don't want to compromise on certain features. 
That's especially true when it comes to sound systems. Many of our customers are looking for value and economy, like this Neon provides. But they want to upgrade a radio or add speakers. So with that in mind, we're going to show you how to install a complete system in a new Neon. Let's begin with the rear seat speakers. First, you need to remove the rear seat by pulling up each end of the seat cushion to disengage the retainer loops from the two cups located in the floor. After you remove the rear seat cushion from the vehicle, use a T55 Torx head bit to remove the two bolts securing the rear seat back and safety belts to the vehicle floor. When the bolts are removed, push the rear seat back upward to unhook it at the top. Then remove the seat back from the car. When you're removing a seat back that has a child safety seat, there are two additional bolts that hold the seat back in place. You can reach these bolts by lowering the safety seat and removing the lining. After the seat back has been removed, the next thing you need to do is remove the parcel shelf trim panel. To do this, you need to remove the seat belt trim bezels located on the parcel shelf trim panel. The best way to remove a bezel is to pry it up along its rear edge. Then remove the parcel shelf trim panel by sliding it down and over the rear seat back position. Next, remove the passenger side door sill and cowl trim panel. Removing the cowl trim panel will expose a four-way instrument panel wiring harness connector beneath the glove box. Connect the four-way instrument panel connector to the four-way connector on the rear speaker wiring harness that was supplied with the Mopar audio system upgrade kit. After making the connection, route the speaker wiring harness along the vehicle floor underneath the carpeting to the rear speaker location. Position the wiring harness across the top of the panel, anchoring it down with the plastic push fasteners. Make sure the two-way connector with the brown and yellow wire and the brown wire with the light blue tracer runs to the driver's side rear speaker. Next, position the rear speakers so that the two speaker wiring connectors face each other. Then fasten the speakers down with four screws and connect the wiring harness to the speakers from inside the trunk. After the rear speakers have been installed, it's time to install the speakers in the front doors. To get at the speaker opening beneath the front door trim panel, you'll need to dislodge the window regulator crank with a door handle removal tool. With the crank removed, take out the two screws securing the door trim panel to the sheet metal. One screw is located inside the armrest pull cup, while the other one sits behind the inside door latch release handle. Now go around the perimeter of the door trim panel and disengage the push-in fasteners holding the trim to the door. Then lift the trim panel from the retainer channel at the top of the door and tilt it away so that you can release the clip holding the latch rod to the inside door handle. Once the trim panel is removed, it's time to install the front speaker. But before you do, remove the door wiring plug from the A-pillar. After discarding the plug, attach the two-way speaker wiring harness connector to the 16-way instrument panel harness at the A-pillar. Then pass the speaker wiring through the door frame behind the door panel to the speaker opening. And be sure to firmly seat the two rubber grommets into the openings at the door frame and A pillar. The door may need to be closed slightly to get the grommets to seat properly. After the grommets are seated, secure the speaker wiring harness to the door sheet metal using the plastic push fasteners on the wiring harness. When you install the fasteners, make sure the fastener that is farthest from the speaker is installed into the hole just above the speaker opening. This will keep the door check strap from coming in contact with the speaker wiring. After you fasten the wiring, join the two-way wiring connector to the speaker and install the speaker in the door panel with three screws. After the door speakers are mounted, the antenna needs to be installed. To gain access to the antenna mounting area, start the vehicle and turn the steering wheel clockwise. This will open up the area at the right front wheel well. Next, remove the push fasteners from the rear of the inner fender shield.
to expose the antenna mounting area. Then remove the antenna hole plug from the top of the fender. When it's removed, align the antenna adapter tongue with a groove in the hole and push the adapter into the fender. Now reach beneath the fender with the antenna base and cable assembly and insert it through the adapter. Then secure the antenna base bracket to the fender assembly by tightening its mounting screw to 75 inch pounds. While you're beneath the fender, remove the plug from the cable access hole in the fender side panel and feed the antenna cable through the hole to the inside of the vehicle. Then install the cable access hole grommet in the side panel. The antenna mast does not come with the Mopar upgrade kit, so it will have to be acquired as a separate item. To install the mast, simply screw it on the antenna body until it bottoms out. Now it's time to install the radio. After you've removed the center module bezel from the instrument panel and the radio blank from the center module, you can access the radio mounting screw holes in the instrument panel. Now connect the antenna extension cable, which is supplied with the upgrade kit, to the antenna cable leading into the vehicle. After making the connection, route the antenna extension cable to the module opening and plug it into the back of the radio. Next, connect the IP harness and ground strap. Then mount the radio assembly in the center module using two screws. As a final step, test the radio using an AM station. If the radio has a joystick balance and fader control, put the stick in all positions to make sure each speaker is working. Now that we've installed a complete sound system in the Neon, it's time to show you how to upgrade the all-new Chrysler Cirrus and Dodge Stratus with a Mopar 6-disc CD changer. We're showing you this because we believe once customers hear the exceptional quality coming from the Chrysler Cirrus and Dodge Stratus sound systems, they'll want to upgrade their vehicle with a CD system. The 1995 Mopar 6-disc CD changer is mounted in the instrument panel, and it only works with the RBS radio which is available as original equipment or as a Mopar upgrade. The new Mopar CD changer is smaller than previous models, and that makes it very easy to install. To start the installation procedure, remove the instrument panel end cap and tilt the steering wheel to its lowest position. Then remove the center bezel from the instrument cluster hood by pulling it straight back. After the bezel is removed, you'll need to withdraw the four screws securing the instrument cluster hood to the instrument panel. Two screws are adjacent to the radio. One is located below the HVAC control. And the final screw sits in the left side of the cluster hood. When all four screws are removed, flex the instrument cluster hood to gain access to the two screws holding the cubby bin in place. Remove the screws and pull the cubby bin out. After disconnecting the light bulb and power outlet connectors, remove the power outlet from the cubby bin. The Mopar CD changer upgrade provides a mounting template that will help you locate the position of a spread nut slot. Place the template into the rear of the forward instrument panel console. Then mark the location of the four holes for the spread nut slot on the back of the console. Now drill the holes with a 1 8 inch drill as indicated on the template you'll end up with a groove to accommodate the spread nut. After you're finished drilling, insert the flat spread nut that was supplied with the upgrade kit in the quarter inch slot. Now it's time to prepare the CD changer for installation. To set up the changer, remove the three shipping screws from the changer. Then cover each of the openings with round stickers. Now set the springs to the horizontal mount H position. After they're in position, install the self-adhesive covers to prevent dust from entering the changer. Now install the large bracket on the top of the unit using the four screws that you found in the installation kit. After the large bracket has been installed, mount the lower bracket on the CD changer using the two screws from the installation kit. Then install the power outlet into the lower bracket. 
Next, insert the CD cable into the forward slot on the rear of the bracket. Now the Mopar 6-disc CD changer is ready for installation. After you've removed the radio, plug the CD extension cable into the radio and slide it back into its opening. Now connect the CD cable to the extension and install the CD changer into the cubby bin location. Secure the changer with the two screws that were removed from the cubby bin. Next, thread a mounting screw through the rear of the CD bracket into the spread nut. When the CD changer is completely mounted, connect the wiring to the power outlet element. Then reinstall the instrument cluster and center bezel back on the vehicle. That's all there is to it. Now let's try a brief review question to test your knowledge. Can you give me the color coding of the two wires that run to the driver's side rear speaker on the neon? Is it A, a black wire and yellow wire, B, a black and red wire and red wire with a green tracer, or C, a brown and yellow wire with a brown wire with a light blue tracer? If you said C, you picked the correct answer. The two-way connector with brown and yellow wire and the brown wire with the light blue tracer goes to the driver's side rear speaker on the neon. Your technical service bulletins offer you a wealth of information that will help you solve many of the common problems that may occur in vehicle sound systems. For example, some 1993 and 94 LH models have been experiencing static or an ignition noise on the AM band. The popping noise varies with engine speed and it occurs more often with the radio tuned to a distant AM station. Chrysler recently released a technical service bulletin, number 84494, which describes how to solve the problem. To eliminate the static, you need to install an engine suppression strap. On LH models with a 3.3 liter engine, you need to use the package that has part number 4796566. On 3.5 liter vehicles, you need 476567. Each package consists of an engine suppression strap and two grounding screws. The difference between the two packages is that the suppression strap for the 3.3 liter engine has two large terminal ends and one small end, while the strap for the 3.5 liter engine has only two terminal ends, one large and one small. To make the repair on the 3.3 liter engine, disconnect the battery and with the vehicle on a hoist, Locate the empty screw attaching boss on the left outboard side of the engine block, just below the starter. Clean the boss with sandpaper, making sure there isn't any contamination or oxidation on the surface. All metal surfaces need to remain clean during this repair procedure. Otherwise, you may lose good contact between the metal parts. After cleaning the engine boss, take the large end of the engine suppression strap the one with the two braids crimped together, and attach it to the engine block attaching boss using the large grounding screw. Allow the terminal end of the suppression strap to rotate on the engine boss. This will provide good metal-to-metal -metal contact between the terminal and engine block. After tightening the attaching screw to 100 inch-pounds, drill a 13 inch diameter hole on the underside of the frame rail. The hole should be drilled out in approximately the same location as the terminal end for the engine suppression strap on the right side of the vehicle. On some LH models, you may have to remove a splash shield clip to get at the proper frame rail location. When you have finished drilling the hole, thread the small terminal end of the suppression strap toward the underside of the frame rail. While you're routing the strap, be careful not to let it touch any vehicle components especially the wiring, exhaust, or driveline components. Now attach the small terminal end of the suppression strap with the small ground screw. Again, allow the terminal end to rotate and bite into the metal, providing a good contact. Finally, torque the screw to 35 inch-pounds. After you've finished tightening the ground screw, install the splash shield if it was removed. Then route the remaining large terminal end toward the left rear cylinder head ground. Now attach the suppression strap's large terminal to the cylinder head ground, 
using the existing screw. After you make the connection, tighten the ground screw to 300 inch-pounds. You can follow almost the same procedure when you install a suppression strap on LH models with a 3.5 liter engine. The only difference is that you have to attach the large terminal of the suppression strap to the left cylinder head boss and tighten it to 100 inch pounds. If you have any questions about installing a radio noise suppression strap on LH models, refer to TSB 84494. It provides an excellent step-by-step -step procedure for the entire operation. In addition to the static noise problem on LH models, Chrysler has issued three TSBs covering the sound systems on Dodge Ram trucks and Jeep Grand Cherokee. It seems that some Dodge Rams are getting poor radio reception. More than likely, the problem is caused by a loose antenna base. This usually develops when the antenna whips excessively during driving. To cure the problem, remove the antenna mast and tighten the antenna base to 70 inch-pounds using special tool C4816. Another TSB points out that some 1994 Dodge Ram trucks may lose sound from the right side infinity speaker if the sound system has an RAY radio. The problem usually occurs when the power seats or some other electrical device is turned on. The infinity speakers generally return to normal operation when the radio is turned off, then back on again, or when a station button is pushed. If you receive a loss of sound complaint on an infinity sound system with an RAY radio, contact your local Huntsville Repair Center. They will exchange the old RAY radio for a new one. The number of the local repair center is located in the Warranty Policy and Procedures Manual. Electrical devices may also cause a noise problem with the Infinity Gold sound system on 1994 Jeep Grand Cherokees. Customers describe the problem as a clicking or popping sound when they turn on the wiper switch or power seat. Chrysler has traced the source of the problem to a faulty ground circuit inside the Infinity Gold power amplifier. If you have a customer who complains about this condition, contact your local Harman Motive Repair Center to have the amplifier repaired or exchanged. You can find a list of the repair centers in section 6F35 of your Warranty Policy and Procedures Manual. The internal diagnostics on the Jeep Grand Cherokee Infinity Gold RBC radio can now be accessed with a DRB3 scan tool. And as many of you know, the RBC package consists of an electronically tuned AM stereo and FM stereo radio, a compact disc player, and an external power amplifier, which is located under the rear seat. When the Infinity Gold RBC sound system is activated, the radio monitors the left and right output channels, digital tuner, CD laser, CD load and eject mechanisms, and its own internal temperature. If a problem is detected, a trouble code is stored in the system's memory, waiting to be accessed by the DRB3 scan tool. Simply put, the RBC system is an electronic module that communicates with the DRB scan tool through the CCD bus. To check out the system, go to test 1A in the radio section of the Jeep Grand Cherokee Body Diagnostic Procedures Manual. This test begins by telling you to connect the scan tool to the CCD data link connector behind the instrument panel at the right side of the steering column. After it's connected, turn the ignition on and select Body from the DRB3 menu. Then select Audio Systems from the Body System menu. If you cannot access audio systems, keep in mind that the RBC radio used in the Infinity Gold sound system has a two-way bus connector, which may not have been plugged into the back of the radio. Once you're in Audio Systems, select Read DTCs. This will tell you whether or not there are any diagnostic trouble codes in the system. If there are any diagnostic trouble codes present, they will show up as a radio error, CD error, shorted left channel, shorted right channel, or an antenna error. The trouble codes can appear on the scan tool separately or in various combinations. In any case, go to test 1B, identifying CCD diagnostic trouble codes. 
the radio must be replaced if a radio or CD error code appears. The other codes require further diagnosis. Suppose, though, the DRB3 shows that no trouble codes are present. In this case, the diagnostics for the Infinity Gold RBC audio system are separated into two groups, radio failures and system failures. If any of the radio failures listed in test 1A is the trouble, there's only one course of action to take, replace the radio. But if the trouble is a system failure, you'll need to continue with the diagnostic procedures. There are four system failures that you may need to investigate. No sound from one speaker, no sound from all speakers, poor sound quality from one speaker, and finally, noise distortion from one speaker. If you find any of those conditions, perform the appropriate test indicated in the Body Diagnostics Procedure Manual. Now let's take a moment and diagnose a sample problem, such as no sound from one speaker. And in our case, let's make the left rear speaker the inoperative speaker. To diagnose the problem, you'll need to go to the Body Diagnostic Procedures Manual and follow the procedures shown in test 6A. When you're performing this test, you must turn the radio on and keep it on throughout the entire procedure. The first question you need to answer in the diagnostic flowchart is whether or not the faulty speaker is a rear speaker. As I said earlier, the inoperative speaker is mounted at the left rear door. Therefore, we need to disengage the left rear speaker connector and probe the positive lead of the connector with a DRB in the voltmeter mode. A line drawing of the left rear door speaker connector is located in the Body Diagnostic Procedures Manual. It identifies the connector cavity, wire color, and function. In our case, the positive lead runs to the second cavity, and it's dark brown and white. If the voltage reading of the positive lead is not above 5 volts, then the diagnostic flow chart will direct you to test 6B which continues the diagnosis procedure by testing the positive circuit running from the power amplifier to the speaker. If you continued on that path, you would find either an open in the circuit or a faulty amplifier. But the initial probing of the positive side of the speaker connector showed more than 5 volts. So now the negative side needs to be checked to see if it has the proper voltage. If the negative lead running from the amplifier to the speaker shows 5 volts or more, then the left rear speaker is causing the problem, and it will have to be replaced. But in our case, the negative lead shows less than 5 volts. Therefore, test 6C must be performed. Test 6C is similar to test 6B, except it's performed on the negative circuit. To perform test 6C, you'll have to get at the power amplifier connectors under the rear seat. With the amplifier connected to the audio system, back probe the negative white and black wire in the number 7 cavity of the 14-way connector. To help you find the correct cavity, there is a speaker system wiring diagram and an illustration of the amplifier connections in your diagnostic procedures manual. If the reading in the number 7 cavity of the 14-way connector is above 5 volts, then you'll need to repair the open circuit between the amplifier and speaker. But if it's below, as in our case, then the amplifier will need to be replaced. As you can see, diagnosing radio failures and system failures is very simple with the DRB3 scan tool. Just follow the step-by-step -step diagnostic procedures in the Body Diagnostics Procedures Manual and you'll soon determine the source of your audio problems. Now that you understand how to use the DRB3 scan tool when diagnosing a system failure, let's test your knowledge with a brief review question. Which of the following radio diagnostic trouble codes requires radio replacement? A, a radio error. B, a shorted left channel. Or C, an antenna error. If your answer was A, then you're correct. The DRB3 scan tool will pick up two trouble codes that require you to replace the radio, radio error and CD error. The other three diagnostic codes, shorted left channel, shorted right channel, and an antenna error require further testing. Well, that wraps it up from here. Join us next time when we discuss 2.5 liter engine service and neon body sealing.
Until then, good luck with servicing Chrysler Sound Systems. We'll see you next time on Master Tech. Thank you.